Holy Spirit. Christ is in our midst. He is in our shadow. So, when I fast, beloved, and I pray and I fast, and I enter into the struggles of the Lenten seasons, I feel like I'm in a storm, and my ship plows through wave after wave after wave, and it is picked up by waves, and it is thrown down into valleys, and it rises again, and it is thrown down again. And it continues to smash through wave after wave after wave, and great efforts are made to move the ship forward, but the ship slams into another wave. And so all the labors that I undertake seem so futile. And yet, when the season of fasting ends, sometimes it's only then that I realize what has happened. But then, when the, fasting, the season of fasting ends, the season of thoughts returns. And all my mind, my mind goes back to all the things of this world, which will not help me very much. And it's only then, in this moment, that I realize what I have. And that despite the fact that what I was shown seemed futile, it wasn't futile at all. Progress was being made, that great progress was made in comparison to what comes after. And so what I want to talk today, beloved, is about spiritual blindness. Because today we celebrate the blind man who receives his sight from Christ, despite the crowd's demands that he keep quiet. Spiritual blindness is such a dreadful thing. Blindness is a dreadful thing. Imagine being a person groping through the dark. It's a horrifying idea. It's terrifying. And yet spiritual blindness is so much worse because if I was to take a needle and gouge out your eyes, you would go dark immediately. If I were to throw you into a dark room and slam the door behind me and there's no crack for the light to go through, you're in darkness and you know it immediately. But see, the problem is our spiritual eyes never really close. They're always open. The problem is not necessarily blindness in the sense of our physical eyes, but that we're always looking at something. But what are we looking at? And what are we actually seeing? And so Satan doesn't gouge out our spiritual eyes. He cannot do that, actually. He has no power to gouge out a man's spiritual eyes. All he can do is he can try to blind him with regard to certain colors, and he can try to guide his eyes to look at other things. And so is the man blind? Yeah, he becomes blind, because he doesn't see the light of Christ anymore. He sees another light, but he sees something. If the devil's careful, he can guide a man into thinking that he's looking at things when he's actually not. He's gazing at something else. When St. Paisus was out in the desert one time, he was on Mount Sinai and he had to walk from, he had to walk for a kind of precarious area. He'd been praying, kind of in this elevated place, he wanted to go back to his cell, so he was going to go back, and all of a sudden this beam of light shone upon him to guide his way. But being a wise man, and his eyes were very well adjusted, he knew that this was the light of Satan, but not the light of God. And he said, I can do without this light. And he pulled out his lighter and lit something and then made his way, because he didn't need this light to help him. In our modern times, our eyes are blinded. We think that the easy life is the Christian life. <coughs> Satan convinces us that we don't need to pursue virtue. Virtue is unattainable, even if it was something we should look for. It's not attainable. And that we should content ourselves with pathetic labors. We should content ourselves with continuous sin. We should content ourselves with seeking the earthly things. In fact, the earthly things are what we should be seeking anyway. And so our minds are guided slowly but surely towards this outcome in which we gaze at everything around us, and we think to ourselves, the Christian life must not consist in much more than me coming to church, confessing the same sins over and over again, continuing in the drudgery of, of my broken spiritual life, and this is all that there is. There's nothing more than this, and this is what my eyes see, and this is all that my eyes see, because my eyes are guided to see nothing else. But the danger of this is that a man can become blind. I was reading about, I, was, I saw this thing about this mine where, this is horrifying, people would go into this mine in the 1800s, and there was no lamps. In fact, lanterns would not work in this cave. So they would do it in this, in this mine. So what they would do is they'd give you a piece of clay, and the men would put the clay on their heads. They didn't wear helmets. This was in the old times. And so they would be mining, and they would put a piece of clay on their head. They'd stick a candle, stick it in the clay, and they'd light it. <laughs> so they had this lit candle on their head, stuck to this clay, and if the, if, the, if the candle went out, hopefully they had matches in a waterproof bag to relight it. Hopefully they did. But here's the thing. If you're in darkness, no light emanates from you. And so if we're in darkness, if we're in a cave that goes dark, if we're in a mine that goes dark, we better have an alternative source of light that comes to us. We need this. We need this. We need to have another source of light. If you're in the forest, you need a reference point. You need to know which direction. You need to know the cardinal directions. If you don't have landmarks, you better know the cardinal directions, and you better know generally where you are, and you better hold a course through that forest. Otherwise, you walk in circles. There's not much difference between the mind that a man that is blind and a man that is lost. If you're at sea, there are no landmarks. And so you better be able to take readings off the stars, and you better be able to know your speed and the cardinal directions, and you can make judgments based on this and guide yourself forward. But in truth, we need landmarks. 
If a man can't take his sextant and take readings, if he's at sea, then he's in trouble. Because he doesn't really know where he is. The clouds cover the stars. I don't know where we are right now. I don't know what our bearings are. I don't know. And so we need landmarks, and we also need light. And Christ grants light to us. He actually does. What is the light that he gives to us? Satan offers a counterfeit light. He did this to St. Paisus. He does this to us every single day, every moment of every day. What does Christ offer to us? Christ gives light to those who love him, who follow him. The light of the martyrs. Today we also celebrate all the martyrs of Russia. A horrifying, horrifying story. Seventy years of martyrdom. Intense martyrdom. All the way from the highest authorities of the royal family, all the way to the lowliest peasants, suffered immeasurably for the sake of Christ. And they are lights to us. Because Satan will say to you what he thinks the authentic Christian life ought to be, but the martyr shows what the real life actually is. And if we're in the darkness of a mind, we can see the light of the martyrs and say, that is the true light, and that is the light toward which I must, I must go. I must move towards this light. I have to move towards this. And the martyrs are the measurement of us. Satan will tell us that Christianity is to be found in comfort and emotions and all these different things, social programs, all this different stuff. This is what Christianity is. But Christianity is never anything less than martyrdom. That's what it is. It actually is martyrdom. That's what Christianity is. There's the martyrdom of blood, that's the highest martyrdom. There's the martyrdom of asceticism, that's monastic life. There's the martyrdom of righteousness. There's the martyrdom of clerics who serve the people. There's the martyrdom of mothers who serve their children. There's the martyrdom of fathers who go down into mines in order and put candles on their heads with clay in order to come back and give bread to their children. There's martyrdom that goes all the way around. And there's different levels of this and different degrees of this. But when Christ says, take up your cross, he's saying, take up martyrdom. Take up martyrdom. Witness to my cross with your cross. Witness to your to my cross with your cross. This is what martyrdom is. And the martyrs teach us everything about what the authentic life is. There was a group of monks in the Soviet Union. Maybe this is even before the Soviet Union was the Soviet Union. This was during the Civil War, probably. But there was a group of monks that were gathered together. And they were put on this boat, and they were taken to this island. And pretty soon they got the idea of what was going to happen to them. They knew that this island was a place of shootings, and they would be shot on this island. They'd just be shot there. And their response was to break out into song. They began to sing with great joy. They began to sing all kinds of hymns. Maybe even the Traparian Apostle, they began to chant hymns, and they were, they were joyful because they realized what this meant. And they began to almost, they, would, they didn't necessarily dance, but they could have. They were so full of joy when they realized, we're going to be shot on this island. These men are taking us to this island in the middle of, the, of this large river, maybe the Volga, and they'll shoot us on this island. And they were so ecstatic. They said, glory to God for this. And so Satan can say that the time of virtue ended in the 400s, but it's not true. That would be a lie. That would be darkness. That would be false. It hasn't ended. It's maybe, maybe it seems far from me, but it hasn't ended. And so these men sang. They sang joyfully. Probably the guards on the ship were very <laughs> surprised by this behavior, but they shouldn't have been. The martyr life is life of great joy. And so if we do not have this joy, we, re we have to realize we're in delusion. There's something lost in us. There's something missing in us. We don't have this martyric joy. We have to have steadfastness. There was a Romanian priest who was a chaplain in the Romanian army when they invaded the Soviet Union. And he was captured at the Battle of Stalingrad. He was taken to this old monastery. And in this monastery, the Russians were keeping prisoners. They were keeping Finns, Italians, Hungarians, Germans, Romanians, Japanese. All these people they had in prison in this monastery. The Romanian priest was doing all kinds of work. In fact, he said he would serve liturgy with a bucket. That's actually what he was serving. He had so many men to commune that he would use a bucket to commune all the men that he was commuting in this prison. In any case, the men had to do work in the prison. The Soviets made it work. And so as they were digging, they began to find these bones that would come up out of the ground. And these bones were fragrant. And they were very dark in color. They were very dark, kind of yellowish, the color of murk. And they would bring them to the priest. They'd say, Father, Father Dimitri, what do you think of this? He said, these are the bones of martyrs. But I don't understand what this is. And one day the Soviets said, you need to go and cut wood. You need to go and cut trees down. We need wood. Go cut this. So the prisoners went out with saws and they began to cut. And as they were working in the forest, and Father Dimitri was working in the forest too, this man suddenly crept out of the forest and came to him. And this man was very thin and very haggard. And the man gazed at him and he said, you're a priest, aren't you? And the man said, I am. I'm a priest. And the man said, do you want to know what happened here? And actually the priest said, I do actually. I want to know what happened in this place. What happened before us? And the man said, God let me live. I, I was a monk. I am a monk. And there was, I don't know, 10,000 men. I don't know how many thousands of men were in this prison camp, in this monastery. This monastery was a prison for quite a long time. And so there was many thousands of men in this prison, and they were all monks or priests or deacons or readers or subdeacons and one bishop. I don't think there was any laymen there. It was just clergymen and monks and this one bishop. And so after they had been assembled there, and this was in 1918, this was the time of Lenin. So this is before the Soviet Union was even a real state yet. 
these authorities came to the bishop and they said, assemble all the people. So he assembled all the men, all these men, all these thousands of monks and priests and deacons and all these people. And he assembled them out together. The authorities said to him, they said, look, we expect you to trample on the gospel. We expect you to renounce your faith. And this is what you must do. And they began to give this long speech. And the bishop cut it all short. He preempted, any mis he preempted anyone's decisions. The communists were kind of saying, if you want to live, step forward. And before anyone could step forward, the bishop stepped forward and he said, <clears throat> he said, no one's going to do that. Not a single man is going to do this. You know, I don't know if the bishop knew whether people were wavering or not, but the bishop wasn't going to let anyone do this. He said, no. He said, no one's going to step forward. No one is going to betray Christ today. No one is going to do any of this. It's not going to happen. I'm sorry, it won't. And the authorities said, is that so? And the bishop said, it is indeed so. That is what it is. And I'm not going to move from that. And the authorities said, okay. Start digging. Dig graves now, please. Start digging. So they would dig, they would dig a, a batch, and they would have a batch of men shot, and put it into the grave, and they'd dig another set of graves, and they would have another group of men shot. And this took quite a while, because they had to dig a lot of trenches to shoot a lot of people, and this went on for quite a long time. So the monk who survived, somehow he hid, and he was spared. And so he went to this priest, who's now living on top of this massive mass grave of martyrs. The monk was saying, you found bones, that's what they are. The bones of all these men that were shot, not a single one of them would yield. The bishop was also shot, but we buried the bishop sitting on a throne, because that's what you do with bishops when they die ruling. You bury a bishop sitting on his throne. That's how a bishop should be buried, not in a coffin, but on his throne, holding his staff, holding the gospel. This is how a bishop is buried. And amongst them, we buried him just like that. You'll find him. If you keep digging, you'll find the bishop eventually. And Father Dimitri said, okay, we will. And so he said, I dug and dug and dug. And we, we, we were guided by the man's directions. And we, when we returned to the camp, we dug and we found the bishop. And we, we uncovered him, and he was, as the man said, he was sitting on his throne, holding the gospel, holding his staff, holding everything. I mean, it wasn't a real throne, it was a chair. That's what they had. They didn't have thrones in the prison, but they just had chairs. But they buried him on a chair. And so we reburied him very reverently in a coffin that we made. We made a coffin, we buried him in it, and we laid him back down to rest with great reverence, because he was a great martyr, this man. The bishop was steadfast, very steadfast. And so this is true life. The true life is not wishy-washy. It's not, it's not tepid. It's sturdy. And Satan will blind our eyes and say, no, all men are tepid. You should be tepid also. Not all men are tepid. Not all men are lukewarm. Not all men are soft. Not all men bend with the wind. They don't. Some men don't bend with the wind. Some men stand. Some men do. That's a lie. Some men do. That's spiritual delusion. Not all men are tepid. Not all men are weak. Some men are strong by the power of God. That's the truth. A truth that you don't want to know, that he doesn't want you to know. And so the bishop was found this way. And so this, this remaining priest, he was very, very, very moved by this. Eventually, he was sent home, but he had many trials of his own, and that's a different story. He was sent back to prison when he got back to his country. But he remembered all of this and was amazed by it. He was amazed by what he saw. All the martyrs, all the bones, all these bones, every one of them smelled so fragrantly. And who knows how many thousands there were. They didn't dig them all up. They found some. They dug the bishop up. They didn't bother to dig out 10,000 relics that were all fragrant and beautiful. And this is the life that Christ gives. But the martyrs are immortal, beloved. They're, they have eternity already. There was this guy working in the 1990s. There was a, an old building that had completely fallen apart, but there was a foundation. And so they wanted to put a new building there. And so they went to this, this construction guy. They said, break the foundation, please. So the guy took the back one. He's going to smash the foundation and dig it up. And as he's digging up the foundation, this building that has gone completely, it's just in a ruin. As he's digging, he digs up the foundation, but there's something inside the foundation that shouldn't be there. This guy's dug up a lot of foundations. And he's laid foundations. He knows all about this. And his backhoe smacks something while he's digging. He smacks it. And immediately he jumps off his backhoe because this is not supposed to be there. And he finds a box. It's a coffin. And he has smacked the coffin enough to where the lid of the coffin has become loose and it's kind, of, it's kind of bumped off a little bit. And all of a sudden this cloud of, of fragrance comes out of the coffin that is unearthly. It is heaven. The guy is almost terrified. The smell is so intense. It is so intense. It is so fragrant. It's so beautiful. Like a bouquet of flowers, but something 100 times greater. It's so beautiful. The construction worker, the Russian construction worker, doing this in the 1990s, he gets up some courage and he, crawl, he gets up near the, the lid and he lifts it a little bit, as much as he can in the moment. And he sees the face of a very young priest that's immaculate. As if the young priest was buried the day before, yesterday. He's just buried yesterday. His face is just serene. And immediately he races away and finds the phone and calls the bishop and he says, you need to come to this place right now. Like, I found something, and I don't know what I found. I found a man in a coffin. He found a saint. And so the bishop came, and the bishop was amazed. And he began to say, okay, we now have to do a lot of research. What is this place? What was, who is this man? What happened? What happened here? 
And so they had to go to the archives, they had to begin questioning old villagers, they had to begin figuring things out. Turns out this young man was a 21-year-old priest who was sent to a village. I Maybe mean, he was 21 when he arrived. Um, he wasn't much older when he was executed. He was a young, very zealous priest, and he lived in this village, and he would do processions, and he would pray, and he would do all kinds of things. And the Soviet authorities, this was again in the 1920s, became very upset about this. They didn't like this kind of man because he was way too vocal, he was way too outspoken, he was way too intense. The communists decided that he and the chief layperson of this parish, the warden of the parish, the keeper of the parish, they had to leave. They had to be got rid of. They summoned the, the warden and the, and the priest, and they met them at the church, and they said, you need to come with us to the other side of the village. The priest wasn't an idiot, neither was the warden, and so he knew very well what this was. And so as they walked, the priest had done so many funerals over his short priestly career that he sang his own funeral by memory, and he sang the funeral for the warden as well, while they walked from one side of the village to the other. When they reached the other side of the village, without trial, they were executed. They were both shot. But the people of the village knew what happened. They could not be concealed. So that night, they dug up the priest and the warden. I'm not sure where they buried the layperson and the warden, but they took the priest back to the church. They dug a hole in the altar of the church in the sanctuary near the altar, and they buried him there. And they put it all the way into the foundation. They dug very deeply, and they buried him there so that no one would find him. And they put him in a coffin. They put him into a nice coffin, and they put him, put him right there. And so this was in the 1920s. The villagers never said to the authorities what happened, and the authorities never bothered to, to try to dig up the remains of the men they killed. They were satisfied that that was a secret, and so they didn't do anything about it. The villagers went through persecution. The church was closed. It became some kind of storage facility. The church rotted. Eventually, the church building collapsed because it wasn't taken care of. And now the foundation is the only thing there. It needs to be dug up so something new can be built there. And that's where this priest is found. And this young man was immaculate. They said that he was as if he had died the day before. His face was just completely full. Very, very intense and very, 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 very pregnant. He is immortal. Even his body is immortal, right? Most men rot. And they rot in a horrible way. Worms devour them. It's, it's disgusting. Most men rot. But this young priest didn't rot at all. In fact, his body was so whole. It was completely whole. It was amazing. It was a miracle beyond all the portions. So if his, if his body is in such a great condition, over 70 years or whatever it was, between the 20s and the 1990s, when he was discovered, what must his soul be in? If his body reeks, it he reeks of heaven and smells of paradise, what is his soul like? So you see the light is present. Christ gives light to you through the martyrs. He gives light to you by testifying to what is in the next world. The martyrs show us this. That shows what the next world is. The martyrs are witnesses. They're witnesses of Christ. The teaching of Christ is not false. If the teaching of Christ was false, where would all the martyrs be? Where would they come from? Why would we have them? And why would there be heavenly fragrance? Why would there be? Why would there be gold and relics found in some prison camp somewhere? Why would any of these things exist? So you have to understand there is light to be found in the world. Light exists. We have spiritual eyes to see this light if we wish to. At the same time, Satan moves us in another direction. And just like the blind man, he cries out the price. He says, Lord, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd says, be quiet. Shut your mouth, blind man. No one wants to hear from you. The demons also tell us this. They also say, quiet, blind people. Remain as you are. Don't see what, what you could see. Don't gaze upon the light that might illumine you. Don't gaze upon the light that might heal your eyes. Don't do that. Please look this other way. Look at sin. Look at your, look at your anger. Look at all the passions you have. Look at all the injustices. Look at everything. Don't look at the light. Look at this nonsense. Look at the trash of the world. If you look at this, you'll be well. Look at the passions. That's the only place to joy. Gaze here. Don't, do not gaze there, but gaze here. And so where we direct our eyes, brothers, is so important. Where we, where we choose to lay our gaze is so important. But the other thing is we need Christ. We need him so badly. The blind man cannot open his eyes unless Christ comes and opens them. And Christ offers us all kinds of light. We must also, at the same time, gaze at the light, but also ask him to say, Lord, help me to see. I want to see. I want to see. Christ smiles. He says, and what would you have me do for you, my son? I will give. I will open your eyes because I want you to. I will show you my martyrs and you will see if you wish to. So beloved, let's look. Let's gaze. Gaze upon the martyrs from every century, but also especially on the last one. The martyrs who died here died only a short time ago. Only a few decades ago they died. And so martyrdom is not something old. It is something old, but it is also something new. And so we have new martyrs even at this moment. We have new lights that are put in the firmament so that we can see. Let us gaze and see. Let us see by the light of the martyrs and follow Christ, always, now and ever, and for the ages of ages. Amen. Amen.